Science for Everyday Decisions, series by Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute, Columbia University. For your consideration for a more sustainable life through education for sustainable development. Today we have Jeff Shigelmich, who is the Deputy Director for the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Jeff, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to talk to you because of personal reasons and for professional reasons and you'll know why. Um, but first, um, just your background, you've been working at the uh, National Center for Disaster Preparedness for some time and you focus on public health preparedness as well as uh, also focus on local level, state level and federal level uh, counseling and uh, discussions. So can you give us a glimpse of what that looks like? Yeah, so, um, you know, we always uh, say, that, you know, the center and a lot of our work is, is built around research, policy, and practice. So in some cases, we're conducting primary research. We have some uh, long-term cohorts on the Gulf Coast affected by Hurricane Katrina and the Gulf oil spill and doing some household survey data there on the long-term health and mental health effects. Um, we do national polling data occasionally on attitudes and opinions and preparedness, things like that. But then, but then always looking at how to apply the latest research, whether it comes from us or other centers, and how, does it, how can we improve the way we're doing disaster policy or disaster practice. And that can be through technical assistance, through advising, through media and op-eds, through uh, training and education, and, and a variety of different forms. But to always make sure that the best available science is working its way into uh, today's problems in uh, disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Um, in my world, I do a lot of international education work. And uh, what I notice is that there is this uh, um, information divide, uh, so to speak, with the work that we do at Columbia University not reaching to the population that will probably be affected by disasters the most. Especially, I work in the sub-Saharan context as well as in uh, South Asia, especially India, Myanmar. So are we doing things here at Columbia University that will reach out to the pop to maximum populations, especially, uh, you know, who are in a different continent, who probably will be more struck by disasters in the coming years as per as per research? You know, that's a, a really, really interesting question, and I appreciate it a lot. I actually was just looking at an article this morning from some colleagues um, in Germany who um, it, it was... Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but something about how there are two hearts in the researcher, and one of them is focused on deep science, and the other is on applying it in the interdisciplinary side. Um, and I think it's a wonderful sort of cataloging on how in academia and in research, a lot of times systems are built to be very focused on generating the best possible information, but not necessarily on applying that to other fields or in bringing in other fields to contextualize that. Specific to Columbia, I think that there are um, a number of venues where that occurs, the Earth Institute being one with which both of our respective centers are, are a part of, um, probably for that very reason, right, is that there's a strong desire of our, ourselves and the folks who, who we get to work with to um, not only uncover new truths about the world around us, but also on how to engage other fields, other disciplines to translate that. I think that there's more that can be done. I think that there's more comfort that could be had in, in academia for non-traditional methods of releasing information like uh, um, op-eds, podcasts, uh, media, in addition to the, to the high-impact journals. But I think that, um, that uh, um, we're getting there as a broader field, and, and I think the Earth Institute is, is in a lot of ways ahead of the curve on that. I also feel that um, working at the Earth Institute is such an honor because it is also at a cutting edge of using science and social sciences together. Um, but in the context of disaster preparedness, uh, what do you think? How do you think that the two sciences are coming together? You know, hard sciences as well as social sciences. Do you think that there's a lot of scope there? Do you think that there are gaps that we've missed um, that may need to be filled up? So um, I'd say yes and yes. 
um, we we are seeing more. Um, uh, I'm actually going to borrow a term from this paper because it's in front of mind. Multidisciplinary work, um, interdisciplinary is a little slower in coming. So so what I mean by that is that there are a lot of great disaster research centers. I think there's over 300 um, uh, and counting, um, particularly post 9/11, when a lot of attention and additional resources came into play. A lot of centers were stood up. But if you look closely at these centers, they actually represent, um, tend to come from a single person or a single group of people. They'll, they'll be based in specific fields and sort of reaching out to be applied to the greater audiences. So there's a number uh, focused on health and public health issues. Um, there's a couple that focus a lot on, on um, social sciences. There's, there's researchers who are really, you know, blowing the doors open on, on the sociology of disasters, building off of prior researchers as well. Um, so, so I think that there's sort of a constellation of research out there and the dots are slowly starting to be connected, but I think a lot more can be done too, to, um, kind of fill in the evidence base and really kind of embrace the cross disciplinary nature, which again is difficult to do when you're working in a school or a department, um, in any university or any academic system that, that sort of incentivizes uh, a deep dive into one field rather than reaching across um, many different fields. But because the nature of disasters are distributed across all aspects of society, um, any successful response and recovery, of course, has to have a harmonious relationship between sociology, psychology, political science, logistics, engineering, you know, agriculture, uh, you name it. So all that being said, the field is also very young. Um, a lot of the foundational research is really just in a generation or two. So in the grand scheme of things, it, it's still very much in its infancy and has come a long way, um, but also, you know, has a lot of future ahead of it. In terms of future, um, do you think that these type of research can be sieved into, uh, you know, school curriculum? I'm asking this specifically because at the Center for Sustainable Development, our work is mainly meant to do education for sustainable development. Um, so I wanted to know if there is any way we can use the research that you and your center are generating to boil it down to such a simplistic level uh, that can uh, that every student or every you know college student can understand or do you think that there is still a lot of you know layers in between and it cannot be simplified to a curriculum level for students no i i, I actually think that that it is very very applicable um and that it can very um readily be made available to students at all different levels <clears throat> so i've actually got a uh, a book coming out later this year that's actually a primer on 21st century mega disasters that's actually intended for, uh, among other things, being a primer on disasters and disaster science, but to be folded in with a broader educational package, whether it's on sustainable development um, or in politics or in, or in other areas, so folks can get a sense of what are the factors um, what, what, you know, there's, there's the deep research and the peer reviewed publications, but then what does it mean? You know, things that range from, you know, the, um, um, uh, with climate change, right? We're contributing to disasters, both in terms of the threat by making, uh, by contributing to more extreme weather events through CO2 emissions and other things, but also to the underlying vulnerability by building in floodplains and amplifying those effects. Uh, I think these kinds of lessons, uh, in many ways, disasters make a very, good context for exploring uh, sustainable development as well as other fields because they all come into play in a very kind of pressurized environment in disasters. Um, so it's, uh, um, and our center in particular is so focused on impact and on translating the science into the impact and into what that means. Um, I think it lends itself to being able to, uh, to teach these lessons at a lot of different levels. So you clearly see that there is a link between uh, disaster management and the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, UN language. And you are seeing how this work can actually work with the rest of the Sustainable Development Goals, especially the climate one, to be able to create an impact. Or do you think this literature right now exists mainly in the U.S. context and uh, there is a lot of scope for SDGs and your work to be translated into other countries? So if it were 10 years ago... And I say this because about 10 years ago, I was looking at this on how we could internationalize a lot of the disaster management work we were doing in the United States. And it was very difficult. We could take, you know, very specific things like um, 
mass casualty training, things that are rooted in like medical science that are very generalizable. But when it came to response systems in the U.S., it was very focused on things like the instant command system and the national instant management system. It was more focused on doctrine. Now, two things have happened over the last decade or so that have brought the scope of international disaster management and domestic disaster management much more in alignment. Um, and I wish I could say it was because of the um, borderless nature of disasters, but that's always been the case. I think the two sort of doctor doctrinal shifts, is that a word? The, the, the shifts in doctrine <laughs> that um, uh, uh, have facilitated this is both um, domestically the shift towards whole community and that you have the whole community as part of the response. It's not just about government procedures and protocols, but is that you can't have a successful response if it doesn't engage broader civil society. Um, and at the same time, of course, we saw the emergence of the sustainable development goals and sustainable development. So all of a sudden, disasters was not just sort of a niche area focused on logistics and procedures. It started to become more and more part of the social fabric of how we live, how we grow, and how we um, become resilient um, and build resilience into the way that we grow society. And what that created was just a, a tremendous number of opportunities to now engage these two sectors that previously had very different language and very different approaches. Um, again, like like a lot of things in this field, I think it's it's very much at the beginning, but I have, I mean, I guess to put it plainly, we've had more opportunities to work in an international environment and more global lessons that we've been able to kind of, re, you know, import back into the U.S. and apply to what we're doing because these two approaches have grown closer with more overlap. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a role of communities, um, even if it is an uh, international goal, sustainable development goals, and its disaster preparedness is linked to sustainable development goals. You feel that the communities need to be involved and communities need to be prepared. Can you give me a specific example of how can a community be involved in uh, disaster preparedness plans? Absolutely. So, so one of the projects that I lead is our Resilient Children and Resilient Communities Initiative. And it's based on a lot of research that we found as, as children as the bellwethers of recovery, that a community's recovery is imprinted on the children of the community because they're connected with all aspects of the community. They also rely on other people to advocate for them, especially at younger ages. And uh, so we, we sort of saw this phenomena over and over again. And then um, we're looking at, you know, how, okay, now that we know it's going to happen, what can we do about it? And that's where this initiative, uh, we were fortunate to work with our, our funders at GSK, um, who who uh, underwrote the first phase and now the second phase of the project. Uh, we worked with Save the Children in the first phase as well, too, to then look at how do you build resilience in a community. And the idea here was that, you know, we have a lot of science, we have a lot of research, we have a lot of technical expertise, but, but the context that this needs to be developed within starts with the child within that community. So we built a project around um, working with um, community partners and the child-serving infrastructure and the emergency management and first response infrastructure. And in the first phase, we worked with two communities, one in upstate New York, one in um, uh, Arkansas, um, sort of getting two different types of communities, different socioeconomic status, different threat profiles, and uh, really looking at um, how we can work with the communities to help build child-focused disaster resilience without at the same time imposing a certain approach or a certain value system. I like to say we, we sort of have a, a buffet of options and things that can be done. And then um, we have some assessment processes and things to help provide some decision support, to provide some information to the community partners. Um, but it's ultimately up to the communities to decide what they want to eat, where they want to get started, um, and sort of on that buffet, what they want to tackle first. And through that process as well, too, we've been working to um, amplify the community voice. As a large Ivy League university, we have access to certain conversation halls in D.C. and media outlets and things like that. And how can we elevate the needs at the community level and ensure that it's part of that conversation? So we had a, a very successful first phase, and now we're actually working in, in North Carolina and Puerto Rico and communities affected by Hurricanes Maria and Hurricanes Florence, who are looking to um, build resilience as part of their recovery strategy. So a, a similar approach, but being adapted for a different environment. And again, always sort of trying to bring the best of what we have to offer as a, as a university-based center, while at the same time acknowledging the, the, the leadership and the decision-making and the uh, capacities that exist at the community level um, that should ultimately benefit but not be dictated to um, 
by the the academic resources that are out there. Disaster preparedness is such a technical term. I feel that there's a lot of science and there's a lot of engineering and there are a lot of different other aspects involved. Um, from a person who doesn't know this field very well, uh, and if there are others who are listening to this uh, podcast and want to be in the same area of research, uh, any tips for uh, them, Jeff, on how can they be involved or what is the type of skills that are required for this kind of work? Yeah, I mean... Uh, disaster science and disaster preparedness response recovery mitigation there's a lot of vocabulary out there and i always tell folks don't get too hung up on the vocabulary because it always ends up changing um <laughs> now there are terms we're not supposed to use anymore versus others so you know we're, we're great at manipulating manipulating vocabulary when we can't solve the problem in academia but the uh <laughs> but uh but to answer your question more directly i mean a lot of folks we get, they come from a wide range of, of disciplines and expertise because disasters affect all sectors of society. Um, you know, you take a situation like Hurricane Maria that had disruption to the electrical grid. It had disruption to, um, you know, the, the political science. It, it ultimately led to a series of events that led to a governor resigning in, in Puerto Rico. Um, there's sociological components in terms of the community who's stepping up and who's not. There's... Um, obvious mental health and child development issues. So I, I think I, it'd be hard pressed to find a discipline that we could not find a place for in disaster preparedness and in disaster science. I think it's more um, disasters are the place where you apply that expertise, where you, where you contribute that to the larger whole. Um, and that being said, I, I think that, you know, we get a lot of folks um, who have dabbled in the arts and the liberal arts. Actually, I did my undergraduate in theater studies. So wow. it's, um, yeah, so there, there's something to be said about then, you know, once we have this information, how do you communicate it? How do you reach not just the minds, but the, the, um, the hearts uh, of those who are affected? And, uh, and what does the scene look like as it all comes together? What are the different component parts to it? Um, so I'm not really doing a good job of narrowing down a pathway to doing it. There are degree programs emerging now. There's a number of higher ed degrees. Um, some of them, you'll, if folks are interested, they'll want to look closely at them. Um, you'll find some programs where a university had a fire science degree and they changed a few courses and now it's an emergency management degree. Uh, others with law enforcement, but then you'll find others that do have a much richer um, sort of set of um, looking at uh, emergency management. The Delaware Disaster Center is one of the um, oldest ones around and probably has one of the more robust degree programs, although there are others out there. Um, but also looking at fields adjacent to disaster preparedness and response, the um, sustainability management degree programs at the Earth Institute are a great place. Public policy is where a lot of the action happens in disaster management. So it's, it's something where folks are interested in the field, I think finding sort of what in what way they want to enter the field and making sure that they're in a program that's going to be um, not just tolerant, but is going to um, be supportive of them um, applying their skills in these areas. I think it'd make a, a very worthwhile way of approaching this from a variety of different degree programs. Mm -hmm. um, so this is truly uh, fascinating because instead of making it a very narrow definition and a program, you've really broaden it so that everyone can find its space and make it much more uh, multidisciplinary. So I, I think you've cleared a lot of my misconceptions about, about the field, Jeff. Uh, now I want you to, to take you to 1984, mm -hmm. um, to Bhopal gas tragedy, uh, um, which happened in my city in Bhopal. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of the biggest um, chemical disasters uh, in the world, man-made chemical disasters. Um, uh, 20,000 people died on the night of, um, you know, in the night in December 3rd, 1984. 200,000 people were physically disabled. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I feel that it was a very, it was, there was too many stakeholders involved. And so it was very difficult to even prepare for such a disaster. So how would you, and even after so many years, more than 25 years have passed by, I don't think we have prepared the city enough or any other city for that matter to avoid such disasters. How do you begin to think about this problem of disaster preparedness with such a big chemical leak that happened? And um, how do you work with different stakeholders to make sure that no more Bhopals will occur in the future? Yeah, that's a, a very, you know, kind of complex question around a very, very um, really 
horrible event um, that was a confluence of a number of different factors. And I think it really speaks to the how complicated disaster management is. On the one hand, if you're looking just at uh, what we call consequence management, and a lot of emergency management agencies, they kind of own a lot of decisions that aren't made by them. Um, so what I mean by that is that the bad thing happens and then emergency management is called up. Uh, there's some preparedness work and other things I'm oversimplifying, but consequence management is all about how do you deal with the consequences of what happened. And for a long time, that was the primary focus of, of a lot of emergency management agencies and to a, a certain extent still kind of is. It's still the um, what they've been built for. Um, and so on the one hand, that, that is one of the challenges, is that emergency management really isn't about a ma- management as it is coordination, because there all are these actors from all different sectors, whether, um, and, and really you find this anywhere in the world, and, and you can even go to some of the most um, centralized governments in the world and still find that there's still different entities in there, that, that, that there really isn't that command and control across different sectors. Um, on a much smaller scale here in the U.S., you know, you look at hospital evacuations. Who has the authority to order a hospital evacuation? And you scratch the surface a little bit, and it, it, it's really not that clear. It's a private business. It's not really under a jurisdiction except for its licensing from the state. So anyway, this, this confluence of different actors is something where having more modern, more robust um, emergency management agencies is one part of it. But I think the larger issue speaks more to mitigation, sort of before uh, preparedness. How do you mitigate these things from happening? And this is where I was talking before about how emergency managers own a lot of decisions that aren't, that they're not a part of. So, you know, in, in the name of economic development, there's this aggressive pace of developing infrastructure. And oftentimes at the expense of safety measures, oftentimes in areas that are sensitive to climate change, and oftentimes at the foot of very large populations. And so it's, it's important to note that, that you know, we build our vulnerability and that oftentimes that vulnerability, that risk is not priced into the calculations when it's driven by... Um, uh, economic development, and in areas where, um, partic- not exclusive to, but particularly India, China, um, uh, ha- are extraordinarily sensitive to economic growth as part of their broader political strategies, and so a lot of uh, exceptions are made. We see that too here in the U.S., and when you have quarterly earnings reports and four-year, six-year election cycles, um, a lot of times the short-term benefit can be incentivize stronger than the long-term um, consequences. Uh, so so there's no simple answer to it other than um, I think it, it's why sustainable development, it's why whole community involvement, it's why disaster management has to be more about just managing consequences and has to be a larger part of the conversation on how we're developing our economies, we're developing our societies. And dare I say the the cost of slowing growth for the sake of building more resilience um, may not be as high once you appropriately price in the risk and the costs of of um, uh, of these tragedies that are seemingly unforeseen, but in retrospect um, are not all that surprising. And you are actually spot on because in my experience, very you know distant view, um, you know, experience that uh, this disaster preparedness is not much of a priority, but disaster relief is because money is attached there and there's a big, you know, cyclone or something happens and then the central government will release all this money to, you know, do things. So, but if you are saying that take a step back, see how development occurs, see how planned and systematic um, that process can be so that you can avert or you know not make those disasters really happen. So that's the next phase of disaster preparedness in terms of um, the next 10 years or so. What do you see as the emerging trends in the next 10 years? I, I think so. I think we need to find a way to better integrate um, the, the cost of disasters into our development decisions. And it's not to say, you know, I was giving a lecture in China and I said, look, if you do everything I tell you to do, you'll have the most inefficient economy on the planet and you won't be able to afford to be prepared, right? There are trade-offs. And I think that that's one of these, you know, unspoken things that's emerging is that sustainable development, disaster management is on a collision course with with economic development. and, and um, But that being said, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and I think that what we need are better indicators, better metrics of what that cost 
is and and to better incentivize it. Um, there, you know, on the disaster side of things and sustainable development, you know, the to afford to be prepared, you have to have you know our economy underwrites um, uh, preparedness and resilience. Um, at the same time, if it's uh, the economy is built on a house of cards that's so sensitive to disruption, um, then it uh, you know naturally is not as um, uh, then, then there's a, a larger cost in the long run. There was a, um, a good article written a number of years ago, um, and it's focused on the U.S. It's called um, something along the lines, I, I, I may have a word or two wrong here, uh, Myopic Voters and Natural Hazards Policy. And it actually, it's a political scientist that actually look at this, and they see, they find that for every dollar spent on preparedness saves as much as $15 in response funding. And even within the election cycle of elected officials, it can save as much as $12. There are a few things with the methodology. Those numbers might be a little higher. But other studies have shown $1 saves 6 They all sort of say the same thing. Excuse me, investing in preparedness saves money down the road. But what they found with voter behavior is that voters did not incentivize preparedness at all. They couldn't care less about it. Mm-hmm. There was no correlation between voter behavior. But there was extraordinarily high voter behavior correlation with bringing in relief funding to the tune of where mm-hmm. for every, I want to say it was around $27,000 of relief funding that was brought in, bought an elected official one additional vote. And so there was a, so we, we reward relief money instead of, uh, so if, if there's a disaster, we don't ask the question, why was this allowed to occur? How did things get to this state? Um, at least we don't ask those questions at the ballot box. What we do is we say, oh, well, this elected official brought in a bunch of money, so they have my vote, or oh, this elected official. So so the incentive systems are, are, are wild, wired a little bit backwards. Um, but I'd also say on the development side, we're very good at saying, in my field, $1 saves you six. $1, it's obvious it saves money. But that's not the decision-making process for development, right? It's, I'm going to build this factory. What's my return on investment in five years? Like the, the level of precision that's needed is greater than what we've been able to provide. So I think that we also owe it to the field to come up with more precise metrics and more robust metrics to be able to more appropriately price in the kind of risk um, that... Uh, um, lack of resilience creates um, and the cost of that risk as well as um, the savings and the benefit that resilience can provide when it's properly managed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Truly fascinating. I think my last question is linked to this idea of incentives. Um, As humans, we know, you know, what we what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Afforestation, we should be controlling haphazard construction, we should be doing so many things that promote eco-friendly behavior. But this doesn't result in any of our actions going towards that. For example, you're talking about the government, that they are not incentivizing the development and disaster preparedness, and uh, they have to deal with much later, much larger consequences in terms of the money being wasted. Um, Is there any research that's been done in terms of, you know, doing much more of a Uh, you know, giving the right incentives to people or giving a lot of uh, incentives in terms of making sure that the action, that the thoughts are actually leading to the correct actions in terms of environment-friendly behaviors. Um, So from the disaster field, I I recall a conversation with a colleague, uh, Joe Trainer at the Delaware uh, Disaster Research Center, and I'm, uh, I'm paraphrasing and hopefully not completely making up. (laughs) We were talking about, um, he looks a lot at the social characteristics of disasters in the center as well. And I remember him talking about how like in emergency management, you know, we look for what is the right combination of words to try to get people to do what we want them to do. Um, And he said that that's actually the wrong question. And that really the reality is, is that there's a range of behaviors that people are likely to do. How do we steer them towards the most beneficial behaviors and then build the response around that? Um, and so, you know, pulling that out further into sustainable development, you know, I, I, you know, I think that there are, um, you know, there are a lot of movements to um, get people to stop eating meat and go vegan, which is, you know, for some folks that'll work, for most folks it won't. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a convenience factor. Like we can say, oh, this should be biodegradable, but I'm not going to bring my own spoon to work, things like that, and a lot of behaviors. And, and um, you know, you, you can make so many adjustments that way but then I think that um, the next level is innovation and we've seen this in agriculture we've seen this in in other fields over the centuries where innovations have made things that were seemingly impossible more possible Um, you know creating more biodegradable materials creating more sustainable sources of energy 
um, deploying them in ways that are easier for people, that are more beneficial to people, um, above and beyond what sounds right, but actually makes their day-to-day -day easier and is able to be more integrated into their life to, um, to do that. So I, I think that um, while quote-unquote correcting people's behavior may give us some fine-tuning to these adjustments, I think that the kinds of innovations um, that are being worked on at places like the Earth Institute, at other places within academia, it's that much more important that, they, that they're connected with the real world <laughs> and with mm -hmm. people out there in communities so that we have a better understanding of what's likely to be adopted by communities, what's likely to be folded into communities, and, and how sustainable development, how disaster resilience can be, um, rather than in conflict with development, can be uh, much more harmonious and synergistic with um, the development and further development of civil society. Well, thanks, Jeff, and um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, just to conclude, that it may be I'll be definitely interested in taking a lot of your materials and uh, work with a couple of NGOs in India, especially in Bhopal, to see what we can do in terms of disaster preparedness at the really local level. Maybe with ladies who are not even that educated, and it will be a real test of uh, this, uh, you know, this area as well as what we can do with general public in terms of uh, making sure that we don't have uh, more Bhopals. Absolutely. And I would love to, uh, one, provide anything that we can, but also learn as much as possible from what you're doing and your conversations as well, too. And, you know, every piece of data that we put out, every publication is really, I mean, we have the privilege of speaking into the microphone and putting the presentations up at conferences, but it's really the the lessons that are learned um, in, in, in my experience are, are really coming from the communities and the survivors of these disasters telling their stories. And I think that um, I appreciate what you're doing and, and anything that we can do to learn and integrate that into the way we, we talk about these things. Great. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. For more on this series, please visit and contact Dr. Radhika Yengar and Hain Shin at edforesty.org, ed4sd.org. Ed